Astronauts to the moon. <laughs> Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Houston, we have a problem. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We can't be on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. What you're seeing here is a mirage. Mirage. What's up, everyone? It's Jaronism, bringing you five facts about the Earth we weren't taught in school. If these differ from any of your current beliefs, you can research each of the facts by following the links in the description below. So here we go. Five facts about the Earth they didn't teach us in school. Number five, the motion and blazing speed of the Earth. The actual motion, speed, and unbelievable movement of the Earth in the accepted heliocentric model of the solar system says we are spinning at a thousand miles per hour at the equator. Now that's only one revolution per day, but we're also zooming 66,000 miles per hour around the Sun. But how about the entire Milky Way, which includes the Earth and the Sun, as together we are racing around the Great Attractor at 2.2 million miles per hour. That's 52,800,000 miles per day and 19,272,000,000 miles per year. Now this Great Attractor we orbit is quite far. It's somewhere between 881 quintillion, 850 quadrillion miles, and 1 sextillion, 469 quintillion, 750 quadrillion miles away. And it's huge. Eta Carinae is 5 million times the size of the Sun. Betelgeuse is 300 times larger than Eta Carinae. And VY Canis Majoris is 1 billion times bigger than the Sun. The Great Attractor is 2 sextillion, 351 quintillion, 600 quadrillion miles wide. That's 2 quadrillion, 719 trillion, 949 billion times the size of the Sun. And with all the distance and the crazy spiraling and turning, not to mention the yearly 585 million mile orbit around the Sun, on January 1st, the stars reset. And through all those 19.2 billion miles, the North Star, Polaris, remains in the same spot. And no one has ever felt anything. Number four, the sphere goes way back. Did people 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, two or three thousand years ago, believe that the earth was flat? In school, we are taught that Columbus discovered America and proved the globe. But now they call that a myth. They now say that no educated person after 500 BC believed the earth was anything but a sphere. They even tell us about Aristophanes and that he measured the circumference and came within 2% of our current 24,901 mile equator. That was back in 275 BC. It is a cute little story, but clearly one of dreams and not reality. First off, no books of Aristophanes have ever been found or survived antiquity, so any belief in such an experiment would be hearsay at best. And in order for the test to work, one would need to know that the sun rays are coming in as parallel rays. And Aristophanes in 275 BC would need to know that even though this is what he would see. And even if he did know that the sun was extremely far away, then he would also have to believe that this infinite sun went all the way around the earth in 24 hours. Anyway, it's a nice little story, but it's untrue. In fact, flat earth must have been around considering we have maps for ages, but the oldest globe we have is 1492. Yes, the knew the Earth was a ball back in 275 BC, and just waited about 1800 years to ever try and make a model of the Earth on a sphere. Mm-hmm. Number three, the old Coriolis wives' tale. The Coriolis effect was definitely overblown to epic proportions when taught to our growing minds in grade school. Despite what we were taught, and despite what swindlers at the equator might show you, water in toilets or tubs does not go down the opposite way in the northern and southern hemisphere. In fact, this force would be extremely small and hard to see, especially with other forces which always exist. You would first need to distinguish the direction of deviation caused by the Coriolis force operating on its own and the direction of rotation when other forces are present. Both directions of rotation are evident in both hemispheres, depending upon whether the flow is around a high pressure area pointing radially outward, or a low pressure gradient pointing radially inward. And please remember, there is no preferred coordinate system when talking about the Earth. Once you adopt a coordinate system, one gets a bunch of forces with it. And when you shift coordinate systems, some forces vanish and others appear. In an inertial coordinate system, 
there is no Coriolis force. In a rotating one, there is. Basically, it is a lot of nonsense, and even referred to as a fictitious force. On the site, avan.com, the following is said about pseudo forces. Today we will ask a few questions such as, what is a pseudo force? What is a fictitious force? Are pseudo forces real? Is gravity a pseudo force? Alas, we will not answer these questions. As far as I can tell, nobody knows and nobody cares, or at least nobody should care. If these questions have answers at all, each answer is a matter of opinion, and opinion is divided. There are no consensus. When I asked several hundred physics teachers via the Phys 1 mailing list, nobody seemed to have any firm opinions. I don't have a firm opinion either. There is no experiment you can do that will tell you the answers to these questions. For example, as far as I can tell, gravity can be classified as a pseudo force, or not. It's six and one half dozen of the other. You can choose to do it either way, and the choice has no observable consequences. The fact that there is no easy answer suggests that we are asking the wrong questions, and that we should ask more physically meaningful questions instead. Number two, the spin of the earth has never been proven. Never. The spin of the earth has never been proven. In fact, many tests have shown the opposite to be true. The Michelson-Morley experiment was set up to prove that heliocentricity was true. In fact, these tests proved, much to the dismay of Michelson, that the earth did not move and was stationary. In 1729, James Bradley proved that the ether is not carried along with the Earth. In 1913, Sanyak proved that there was an ether, which destroys relativity, which says that there is no ether. In 1925, Michelson Gale proved that the ether passed over the Earth every 24 hours. And in 1871, Aries failure proved that the stars move, not the Earth, which allowed in 1887 the Michelson Morley interferometer experiment to prove without a doubt that the earth does not move. Did you learn about these experiments in school? Of course not. In fact, there is no experiment that has ever proved that the earth moves and many more that prove the opposite. Albert Einstein said, soon I came to the conclusion that our idea about the motion of the earth with respect to the ether is incorrect if we admit Michelson's null result as a fact. This was the first path which led me to the special theory of relativity. Since then, I have come to believe that the motion of the Earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment, though the Earth is revolving around the Sun. James A. Coleman said, The easiest explanation was that the Earth was fixed in the ether and that everything else in the universe moved with respect to the Earth and the ether. Such an idea was not considered seriously, since it would mean in effect that our Earth occupied the omnipotent position in the universe, with all the other heavenly bodies paying homage and moving around it. Julian Barber said, Thus, even now, three and a half centuries after Galileo's condemnation by the Inquisition, it is still remarkably difficult to say categorically whether the Earth moves, and if so, in what precise sense. Stephen Hawking said, So which is real, the Ptolemaic or the Copernican system? Although it is not uncommon for people to say that Copernicus proved Ptolemy wrong, that is not true, as in the case of our normal view versus that of the goldfish. One can use either picture as a model of the universe for our observations of the heavens can be explained by assuming either that the Earth or the Sun is at rest. And finally, George Ellis said, people need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I can construct for you a spherically symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. What I want to bring into the open is the fact that we are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. A lot of cosmology tries to hide that. So, they have made the Earth spin and orbit the Sun, not through the scientific method, but through their ideology and desire to keep the Earth and its importance minimized as possible. And lastly, number one, tis the season to be folly. The seasons, as explained by heliocentrists, are extremely flawed. If our seasons do in fact come from the tilt of the Earth as we orbit the Sun, then there's quite a few things we'd expect to see that we don't. First, during the southern summer, it is the rays hitting the north at a greater angle and the south getting more sun, hence it is their summer. But why then is there a frozen continent at the bottom of the globe, while in the north there's nothing but a pool of water? Because during the northern summer, the same thing but opposite happens. The north is getting the greater sun 
as the south is getting the higher angled sun. Why then do we have this pool of water and no North Pole ice cap? So if as we are taught, the tilt led to the seasons, then north and south would be the same. Also, we would expect to see hotter temperatures on Earth in the south. Why do you ask? Well, there's a little known fact in the heliocentric model that the Earth is actually closer to the sun during the southern summer. Yes, that's right, if you live in the north, during your winter, the sun is closer to the Earth. By how much? By 375 Earth diameters. So, we should see signs that the south is slightly warmer than the north. Well, do we see any signs of this 375 Earth diameter difference? The south has a frozen continent. The north does not. The north has 14 of the hottest 15 temperatures of all time. Lastly, let's take a look at the difference between 70 degrees north and 70 degrees south. Virtually, they should be close to identical. If anything, the south should be slightly warmer and more nurturing for life. We should see comparable temperatures, seasonal changes, length of day, plant and animal life, and the fact that there is so different of a selection of animals and plants tells us the globe model has major faults. In the north, we get warm summers. The southern summer does nothing to change Antarctica. The south has eternal winter, and the snow never melts. As far north as you can go, you'll find birds, reindeers, squirrels, rabbits, insects, and all decorated with plants, shrubs, flowers, and more. Within 70 degrees south, no plant, insect, or bird is found. At 49 degrees south, only 18 species of plant exist. If you go to 65 degrees north, which is 16 degrees further from the equator north, you can find Iceland, which alone has 870 species of plant. On the Isle of Georgia, at 54 degrees south, same latitude as England in the north, where forests, shrubs, and all kinds of plants and flowers exist, Captain Cook said that there was not a bush or shrub to even make a toothpick. And beyond 70 degrees south, no plants, flowers, or trees exist. And again, 14 of the top 15 temperatures of all time are found in the north, not the south. So, there you have it. Five facts about the Earth we didn't learn at school. So to you kids out there, when you get back from Christmas vacation, ask your teachers about these five facts and see what they say. And to recap one more time, the motion and speed of the Earth around the unfathomably huge and never observed great attractor are too great to ignore. The spherical Earth belief may be a recent addition to our knowledge base as the idea of 1800 years passing with no globe ever being constructed is too great to ignore. The Coriolis effect is a fictitious force and our circling weather patterns have much more to do with winds and pressure differences than anything to do with a one rotation per day spin that would have very little if any effect on water or weather systems. The spin of the earth is not a scientific fact. In reality, it's the opposite. A religious belief, a dogma, and a presupposition for those who want to join or compete in an academic or scientific environment and the taught reason for seasons does not meet our reality. So, there's lots of work to do. If the answers that you are given by those you ask are wrong, then no one should ask why you're questioning those answers, as it should be apparent that when one asks questions, they're actually looking for answers that are true. And it appears you're gonna have to find those on your own. So let those who want to believe in lies believe them. You can lead a man to a river full of fish, but if he's content with starving, it will do no good. Because only when that man is hungry will he see that the river is full of fish. Otherwise, he may even argue with you about what difference does it make if there's any fish at all. And he's right. The river is for those who are hungry. And with the breadcrumbs and the imitation and artificial food that we all got from our public schooling, it has left many of us dying for any food that we can find. So be kind to each other and don't lie to each other. And open your mind, because there's truth inside. Till next time, this has been Jaronism. Peace!